So we are going to uh, look into the uh, fifth point, the fifth point. So we already discussed all the all those things about uh, the uh, uh, the fourth um, at four points. Now we are coming to the uh, fifth point. Okay. So the fifth point is from Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. From Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. From Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. So we have been discussing about from where the uh, from where the grace and peace is coming, or the source of the grace and peace. That was the main heading that we have been uh, discussing in the previous class. The source of the uh, peace and grace. Now, uh, the fifth point is it is coming from Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. That is in chapter one, verse. Five. I will read that verse for you, then we will explain from that. That is, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn of the dead. So that is there. That is the point. Okay. So uh, this is not the, the, the birth uh, of Jesus. Rather, uh, this speaks about the resurrection of Jesus. It speaks about the resurrection of Jesus. That means, you know, there are many references both in the old testament and the new testament speaks about uh, the resurrection of many people you know there are many people resurrected or risen up from the dead both in the old testament and the new testament uh, but they all resurrected and died again they all resurrected that is true but they died again but jesus died and resurrected and no more he is going to die no more he is going to die so that's the reason we can call him as the Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn of the dead. There are many people already resurrected from the dead in the Old Testament and the New Testament at the same time. Jesus also died and resurrected and Jesus is no more going to die. Okay, so so that's the reason we can call. And, and can you just uh, uh, tell me uh, uh, at least one person uh, uh, from the Old Testament and also from the New Testament who risen up uh, from, from, from death? Anybody? Anybody? In the Old Testament and the New Testament, at least one person from the Old Testament and New Testament who risen up, who resurrected from the dead. Aksa is saying Lazarus. Lazarus. Okay. That is true. From, from the New Testament. And any, any one person from uh, Old Testament? The boy in Elijah's time. The boy in Elijah's time. Good. Okay. Good. You know, the son of, uh, the, the, the son of widow, you know, at Seraphat. The son of widow at Seraphat. That is one. The one. And in, in, in New Testament, another one is that, uh, that what is that, the, the son of widow at a uh, city of nine. The son of widow at a uh, uh, city of nine. Okay. Whatever it may be. So, God raised Christ. So we understand from this point, we can, we can go to that point, you know. God raised Christ from the dead. First, and again, God will raise up all believers who lived in Christ and died in Christ. So in that way, Jesus becomes our elder brother. So when we go to that I mean, particular point that I mean, uh, Apostle John is trying to explain here, that is, he is the Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Okay, so that means you know the the, the Greek word which is used for uh, the firstborn uh, is I mean uh, prototokos. Prototokos is the Greek word which is used for uh, the the firstborn. Okay, then uh, literally the first son. That means the, literally that the meaning of the prototokos is. The first son also has the inheritance of the father's honor and power. The person who is having the inheritance of the father's honor and power, he is known as the prototokos. It means the first son, the first son, the first son. Okay, so that is the meaning of the firstborn. So Jesus is the firstborn, that means Jesus is literally the first son. And also, he is having the inheritance of the father's honor and 
the power. Now, we will go to the, I mean, sixth, uh, uh, sixth source, okay, sixth point. Point number six, from where the, uh, the, the, the I mean, peace and grace is coming. Sixth point is from the ruler of the kings of the earth. From the ruler of the kings of the earth. From the ruler of the kings of the earth. That also is from chapter 1 verse 5. From the ruler of the kings of the earth. It is there. It is written there itself. To him. Yeah. Uh, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. It is written in the chapter 1 verse 5. So that means uh, he is in control of everything. He is in control of everything. So he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. When you read uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, uh, Satan had offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. You know? uh, that's what we read in Matthew chapter 4. You know, no need to read. We all, all of you know that. So when uh, Satan was trying to tempt Jesus, uh, he was offering all the, all the kingdoms of this world and also the, the, the splendor of the world. But Jesus refused that and gained the authority by his death on the cross. So that's the reason he became the ruler of the kings of the earth. There are many kings in this earth. There are many lords in this earth. And there are many uh, 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 princes in this earth. But we understand here, Apostle John is saying that you are receiving the grace and peace from one area that is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That is Jesus Christ. That means he is in control of everything. Even uh, Satan was trying to tempt him, uh, showing that the kingdoms of this world and the splendor of the world and the earth. So he, I mean, uh, refused everything and he gained authority by the death on the cross of Calvary. So, okay. So when Jesus came first time, you have to understand one thing from that point, you know. When Jesus came first time, he was traveling on a, on a, on a donkey. Is it right? When Jesus came first time, he was tra traveling on a donkey. Okay. But next time he will be coming on a white horse. It is, it is, in, it is in the same book. Okay. It is, we are coming to that point. So the first time when he came to this world, he was traveling on a donkey. But next time when he will come to this earth, it, it, it is going to be on a white horse. It is going to be a white horse. That is first time there was no space for him to born and to stay. That's very clear. When Jesus was born into this world, there was no space for him to born and to stay. There was no room, room for to stay for him to stay. But in his second coming, the world will not be able to contain the weight of his glory. Okay, First time, when he came to this year, there was no space for him to born and to stay. At the same time, in his second coming, the world will not be able to contain the weight of his glory. That is what we read uh, uh, when he, uh, in, in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4, Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4, it says that, I mean, when he put his feet on the mountain of olive, and the mount of olives will be split into two from east to west. In Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4. Okay, so when Jesus is putting his feet on the, on the mountain of olive, the mountain of olive will be split in two, two from east to west. Okay, that is what uh, we read in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4. Which shows the power and the glory and authority over all the kings and lords of the universe. Okay, so Jesus Christ is having the authority and the power over all the kings of kings and the lords of this universe. Okay, so that is the meaning that we can understand that he is having that power and he is having the authority. You know, uh, you may be uh, having a confusion that uh, when this is going to happen. That means when Jesus is going to uh, 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 put his feet on the mountain of olive. This will happen after the seven years of tribulation that we will discuss in the later, maybe uh, when we go on. Okay, so this is going to happen after the seven I mean, years of tribulation. 
and Jesus with the people of God will come to the come to rule over the earth, and that is called as the as the millennial kingdom. Okay, we will be discussing about that later. So the millennial kingdom. So Jesus ascended into heaven from the the mountain of Olive, and he is to he is going to return to the same spot on the earth. Okay, and he is uh, he is to I mean set his foot on the same mount of Olive. Which is in front of the Jerusalem at the end of the seven year of uh, tribulation. At the end of the seven year of tribulation, and on that day, on that day, most amazing earthquake, I mean, uh, will occur, uh, which will open up a massive valley running through the center of Jerusalem from east to west. Okay, that is what we read in uh, Zechariah chapter fourteen, verse four. So uh, then the world will know that God is the Lord. Now. There are many people they are not able to uh, they are not able to I mean, accept Jesus as the Lord or Savior or the or the King, but on that day on that day when He is coming down to the earth, okay, so all the people of this world, all the people of this world will know that God is the Lord. So this is the reason that John also was receiving these visions about many things and even was saying that. The peace and peace and grace is coming from uh, coming from from the ruler of the kings of the earth. That is, that is in Revelation chapter one verse five. Okay. Now we will uh, uh, go to the seventh point, seventh uh, uh, place or seventh area from where uh, uh, the peace and grace is coming. It is from him who loves us. It is from him who loves us. That also is in the same verse. Verse 5, it is read. To him who loves us and released us. Okay, so that is very clear. There is no need of uh, uh, explaining that point. He loved us and came down to the earth in search of a sinful man. So the peace and grace is coming from God. Amen. So that is what we understand from him who loves us. From him who loves us. Okay, so we will go to the eighth point, eighth point. That is, from him who released us from sins by his blood. From him who released us from sins by his blood. The same thing is in the same verse, chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. So listen to that point, you know. He loved us. God loved us. That's why he set us free from the bondages of sin and Satan by his own blood on the cross of Calvary. So the point is, the peace and grace is coming from our and. And the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ has given the grace and peace. Okay. And the grace and peace is coming from the, 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 the God Jesus Christ who released us from the sins by his blood. Okay. So that is what we understand. And he set us free. Jesus set us free from the bondages of the sin and the Satan and the world by his own blood on the cross of Calvary. By his own blood on the cross of Calvary. And when you read... Uh, First John chapter one verse seven. First John chapter one verse uh, seven. Uh, it says uh, like this that, but if we walk in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sin. Okay. That means. That means. I mean, uh, 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 and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses from all sin. And also, one more verse is there, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It is, uh, uh, it is, and there is salvation in no one else, 
for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So that means uh, these two verses speaks about the forgiveness of sin. The forgiveness of sin is possible only through Jesus Christ, no other ways. Amen. So we have to uh, uh, remember one thing that always only through the blood of Jesus Christ or when a person is become becoming a Christian or when a person is becoming a saved person or child of God, there is a particular time for that. That is the born again experience or salvation or accepting Jesus as his personal savior and believing that Lord Jesus Christ died for me and I believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, That's the way that we are getting the forgiveness of our sin. You know, in, uh, uh, in the present situation, there are many people, uh, they are going for uh, different, different uh, 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 places to get the salvation or uh, in, you can call it as a moksha for their spirit. Okay, moksha for their spirit or the salvation. Okay, so, uh, but we understand uh, that the forgiveness of the sin is only possible through Jesus Christ, only through Jesus Christ. That is what uh, we understand from these two, three verses. Okay, so the grace and peace is coming from Jesus who released us from sins by his own blood, by his own blood. That is very clear it is clearly written there and now we will go to the ninth point ninth point from him who made us kingdom and priest to god from him who made us kingdom and priest to god From him who made us kingdom and priest to God. That is in chapter 1, verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6. It is very clear in that verse that, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to whom be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the real translation is, uh, it is written like this, he made us kings and priests. Okay. So the ninth point is from him who made us kingdom and priest to God. But the real translation is, he made us kings and priests. He made us kings and priests. So the New Testament church has been called to be the kingdom of priests. Is that right? The New Testament kingdom. New Testament church is called as the kingdom of priests. That is in First Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. First Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for the holy priesthood. Holy priesthood. Okay. So we are the holy priesthood. And verse 9. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So God called the, the, the New Testament believers as the royal priesthood. We all are priests by the grace of God. Okay, so that is the meaning of that particular phrase that the grace and peace is coming from him who made us the kingdom and priest of God. We are the members of the kingdom of God and also we are the priest when we are in this world, okay, we are the priest of God. Okay, so we have a, a, a particular duty to do as a priest. Okay, so that's the reason that God has called us from the darkness to to spread the light towards the people of this world. Okay, so that is the ninth. Pro, I mean, I mean, a, a point that the grace and peace is coming from Him who made us the kingdom and priest to God. Now we will go to the. Uh, a tenth point. The tenth point is from him who is coming back. From him who is coming back. That is in chapter 1, verse 7. 
chapter 1 verse 7 it says like this behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him so it is to be a man that means from him who is coming back that is in chapter 1 verse 7 so listen christ will come with the clouds christ will come with the clouds okay and you know the second coming of jesus christ will not uh, will not occur on the earth but up to the cloud and the clouds will be the vehicle for god to come down from the third heaven which is known as the heaven of heavens okay so you have to just think about one thing that jesus christ is going to come soon so the peace and grace is coming from from him who is coming back that means the second coming of jesus christ so the christ will come with clouds it is written there in in verse 7 that christ will come with clouds that means the clouds will be the vehicle for god to come down from the third stage of the heaven to the earth okay third stage of the heaven means known as the heaven of the heavens the sky is there the atmosphere is there the sky is there then the third i mean heaven that means third stage of the heaven okay so from there uh, uh, jesus is coming back with the the vehicle of the cloud okay so that's what uh, we understand from there and the peace and grace is coming from her i mean uh, coming from him who is coming back coming back so it speaks about the second coming of jesus christ okay then we will uh, go to the uh, uh, 11th point the 11th point is from him who is the alpha and omega from him who is the alpha and omega That is in chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. I'll read that verse for you. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I am the Alpha and Omega. That is in chapter 1, verse 8. You know how many letters are there for the Greek uh, Greek language? How many letters are there for the Greek language? Anyone knows? Greek language? It is 24, okay? 24. There are 24 letters for the Greek language. And how many letters for the Hebrew language? 22. 24 letters and alphabets for Greek language and 24, sorry, 22 letters for Hebrew. So here it says that the grace and peace is coming from Alpha and Omega. Who is the Alpha and Omega? That means Alpha is the first letter of the greek language first letter of the greek language okay that alpha starts from alpha and ends with omega alpha beta gamma delta epsilon eta zeta eta like that okay so i know the letters of the greek but i don't know uh, all the letters of the uh, hebrew language but this is okay the first one is the alpha and the second one is the omega and uh, uh, and uh, uh, in 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 hebrew uh, it is uh, uh, the, the first letter is Aleph. First letter of the Hebrew language is Aleph, and the last letter is Tau. Aleph and Tau. So, if you do not know that, you can go to uh, Psalm number 119. Psalm number 119, you know, the Psalm number 119 uh, is divided into, into, uh, into 20, 22 sections. Uh, maybe each verse contains one letter of the Hebrew language. So the first eight verses of Psalm number 119 is uh, it, there is a there is a there is a I mean heading written Aleph Aleph, and like that each eight I mean verses of uh, Psalm Psalm number 119 is uh, I mean revealing 
the 22 letters of the Hebrew language. So we will leave, leave that. That is not our matter. So which shows, you know, it, the, the point is, which shows his completeness. His completeness. Right? Alpha. Jesus, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega means it, it shows his completeness. And he is the beginning and the end. He is the beginning and the end. If you are writing down, you can note it down. Okay. What is the meaning of the Alpha or Omega? Alpha and Omega. The completeness. The completeness. And he is the beginning and the end. And he is the source of all wisdom. He is the source of all wisdom. And also, all knowing God. All knowing God. This question I'll ask next class. What do you mean by Alpha and Omega? And how many letters are in Hebrew? How many letters are in Greek? Which are the 24 letters of Greek language? That was I last. Okay, so what is the meaning of Alpha and Omega? Beginning and the end. It's beginning and the end, completeness, and uh, source of the wisdom, source of all the wisdom, and all knowing God or omniscient. Omniscient is the all knowing God. Okay. That means he knows the beginning and the end of all. He knows the beginning and the end of everything. End of everything. Okay, so we'll come to the 12th point. 12th point. That also is in chapter 1, verse 8. What is that? The peace and grace is coming from the Almighty God. From the Almighty God. That is the 12th and last point. Okay. Uh, verse 8 I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty God. The Almighty God. The word Almighty is, uh, in, in Greek, it is uh, 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 Pantocrator. Pantocrator is the Greek word for Almighty, Almighty, okay? Which describes the one who has the dominion over all the things. One who has the dominion over all the things. That is the meaning of the uh, Greek word, I mean, Pantocrator, which means the Almighty God, Almighty God. And he is having the dominion over all things. Okay. Now, what do you think, you know, why Apostle John is, I mean, uh, giving all these descriptions about God and Jesus Christ? You know, why he is doing all those things? You know, he is that and he is, he is the almighty God and peace is coming. The grace is coming from uh, uh, God who is the ruler of the kings and uh, I mean, he is the almighty God and all those things. What would be the reason? And he says he is the Alpha and Omega. He says about God, he is the Alpha and Omega. And Jesus is coming back. The peace and grace is coming from Jesus Christ, who is coming back. The reason is, the reason is, you know, these churches were going through a tough situation. They were having many persecutions in there in the in the churches so because of that reason apostle john is trying to increase the people and he is trying to comfort the people there is no problem even though you are going through the trials even though you are going through the difficult situation there is no problem god's presence is with you and he is the alpha and omega he knows everything he is the i mean he is the beginning and the end he is omniscient and he is all-knowing God. You, God knows everything about your life. Do not be worried about anything of the persecution of this world. God will take care of you. So, so that's the reason that Apostle John is explaining all these things. Then he's saying that, okay, the peace and grace is coming to you people from Jesus Christ, who is, who is, who is, and who was, and who is to come. Praise God. Amen. So is there any, 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 any question from that portion from from chapter uh, 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 one verses uh, one to eight from the present portion that we have taken. <clears throat> so I hope it is very clear. You got it thoroughly, you understand. 
right good we'll go to the next portion that is chapter 1 verses 9 to 20 the heading is vision of jesus christ vision of jesus christ vision of jesus christ chapter 1 verses 9 through 20 so i already uh, preached a sermon from verses 9 to 12 on a sunday on a sunday uh, uh, what was the title you remember that what was the title of that message especially from verse 10 It was not the last Sunday, but the other Sunday. It was, what was uh, that? in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the spirit on the Lord's day. Praise God. Some of you remember that. Okay. So, in the spirit on the Lord's day. So, and already I covered the topics about uh, uh, why John was banished to Patmos, and and uh, there were four things happen when he saw. He was in the spirit, right? When he was in the spirit, he had four experiences. How many of you remember that four experience that John had when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day? One by one. He heard a loud voice. He heard a loud voice. Saw a vision of Jesus. He saw the vision of Jesus. Saw the spiritual condition of the church. He so the spiritual condition of the Christian church. And then fallen down at the feet of Jesus. Then the experience, the last experience is he has fallen down at the feet of Jesus. Okay. So that was the I mean topic and the, the, the portions that we were covering. So I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, discuss from that portion. So that is already covered. Okay. Now from verses 12. Okay. So, uh, verses, verse from, from verses 12, he is explaining the vision that he received. The vision that he received. That is the, that is the explanation. Okay. But, uh, you know, one thing you have to remember about uh, this portion that, you know, uh, Apostle John is using uh, the symbolic language. Maybe the words of, words of, uh, words as a symbols. Okay. He is using the symbolic language to explain the vision. Okay, to explain the vision. So he is using that symbolic language or uh, some of the words like uh, symbols, okay, and uh, just trying to explain the vision that he was receiving from the Lord on the Lord's day when he was in the spirit. Okay, so when you think about the, the symbolic words, okay, so I have to give you one chart. I will give you one chart. Um, what is the meaning of the symbolic uh, language or symbolic words used uh, uh, in uh, in book of Revelation. Okay. Um, one second. Okay. So now um, uh, the chart of the symbolic words and its meaning in the book of Revelation, uh, I have uh, posted that chart in the WhatsApp group now, okay? Because uh, that will take more time, okay? It will, uh, uh, it, it's a waste of time. So we are not going to look into that portion, but even, I mean, you can see the slide also there, right? You can see the slide also, but we are not uh, talking about anything from that point, that uh, point, because there are 31 symbols in the book of Revelation. 31 symbols are there in the book of Revelation. Uh, for example, okay, it is written in uh, uh, chapter 1 verse 16 that the seven stars, the seven stars it, it is written and you may, no need to write down those, those points, okay? No need to write them because there, this is, there, there are 31 points. There is no time to write down that. And it is there in your uh, WhatsApp group. You can look into, look into that also, okay? So what, you, you do not know that uh, the, what is the meaning. It, it's a symbol. It's a symbol, symbolic language, the seven stars. Okay, what is the meaning of seven stars? The angels or the ministers of the seven churches. So that is what we understand from that. And 
that way we are going to interpret the bible so now we will we will come to that portion that let us read uh, uh, chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 any one of you can read that verse chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 <clears throat> Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Praise God. So now, all of a sudden, when you read that verses, you may not be understanding what is the real meaning of that word. Okay, so that's the reason that we are trying to uh, interpret those symbolic phrases or words, okay, uh, of this, I mean, this chapter with the help of the other verses from the Old Testament and also from New Testament. Okay, so there are many supporting verses. There are many supporting verses which through which we can understand what is the real meaning of the uh, symbolic language which is used in chapter 1, not only chapter 1 and the other chapter, the remaining chapters also. So here in this verses, chapter 1 verses 12 and 13, it says that and in the midst of the seven damn stands, one like a son of man clothed with a garment, okay, garment down to the feet and gird about the chest with a golden band. Okay, so now we are going to see what was the vision that he received? What was the vision that he received when he was, I mean, uh, in, in the spirit and on the Lord's day? Okay, the first vision, the first vision was, he was seeing that seven golden lampstands. Seven golden lampstands. The seven golden lampstands. That is in chapter one verse 12. Chapter 1 verse 12. It says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. We will try to understand what is the meaning of those usages, okay? Here, seven lampstands are seven churches. Seven lampstands are seven churches. That is in chapter one, verse 20. It says, as for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It is very clear. It is very clear. Okay. When John was seeing that seven lampstands, seven lampstands in chapter 1, verse 12, the explanation is in chapter 1, verse 20. Okay. So it says that seven lampstands are seven churches. Okay. So seven is the number of perfection in the Bible. There are many times the number seven is used. It's, a, it's, it's, it's known as the, the scholars are saying that uh, seven is the number of perfection. So the seven churches used here is representing the, the, the all Christian churches in all over the world. Okay, If the number seven is the number of perfection, we can take that as a representation the seven the, the number seven uh, or the, the the seven lampstands or seven churches are the representation of all the christian churches in all over the world and all the churches are included in these seven churches all the all the global churches are included in the seven churches that we will understand when we go to the uh, study about each church Okay, seven churches are there and we will study about each church then what is the what is the problem of that church and what is the message that john is writing to those churches okay that we will discuss later so here uh so uh, here it is written so gold is the precious okay it is written it is it is a golden lampstand right it's a golden 
lampstands. So gold is the precious and shining metal than all other metals. Okay, so we are going to, we are trying to interpret that one. Okay, the, the speciality of these, I mean, a, a, a lampstand is the lampstands are out of gold, made out of gold. So gold is the precious and shining metal than all other metals. That means the meaning of that word is the congregation of the believers or the church is the most precious and glorious and valuable factor in the sight of God. Amen. What is church? And what is the speciality of the church? Okay. And how God is considering the church, the congregation of the believers or the church. It's a, it's a most precious and glorious and valuable factor in the sight of God. That is what we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I'll read it for you. Be on guard for yourself and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which is which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, that means Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. So how precious is the church of God? I'm not talking about the local church of God, Sacramento, but I'm talking about the, the global churches, the global church. Okay, so the, the universal church, the universal church. So how precious is the church of God? Because Jesus purchased the church, the believers, the children of God with his own blood. Again, in Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. If anybody is taking that verses, you can read, okay? Otherwise, I'll read. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15. So that... You will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as light in the world. That means the church is supposed to be the light in the midst of the crooked people and the crooked generation and perverse generation. Crooked and perverse generation is there and we church is supposed to be the light in the midst of those people okay so that is the first point you no know, the seven lampstands the seven golden lampstands the seven golden lampstands speaks about seven churches seven churches okay so all the global churches or the universal church every churches are included in the seven church okay now we will go to the point number two Point number two is in the middle of the lamp stands one like son of man. In the middle of the lamp stands one like son of man. Chapter 1 verse 13. Chapter 1 verse 13 it says, And in the middle of the lamp stands I saw one like a son of man. In the middle of the lamp stand, one like a son of man. This son of man indicates Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is the son of man, which is written in chapter 1 verse 13. Jesus Christ is the son of man. The Old Testament prophet had the same a similar vision of glorified Christ in Daniel, book of Daniel. So that's the reason that we will be just uh, uh, referring or uh, quoting some of the verses from the Old Testament, especially from the prophetical books, uh, maybe book of Daniel and, and some other books. Okay. So here in the Old Testament also, when Daniel was getting the vision from the Lord in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and uh, uh, chapter 10, verses Verses 5 and 6. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9.
I keep looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days look his seat. His virtue was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning <coughs> fire. Okay, so the same thing is happening. The same vision that Daniel also received about the glorious Christ Jesus. But Daniel was not knowing that this vision is about Jesus Christ. But John received the vision and he understood that it was Jesus Christ. Okay, so Daniel was not knowing what is going to happen. And Daniel was not getting the, the clear vision, clear revelation about the New Testament and the church. But John is clearly says that the middle of the lampstand, there is one like a son of man, that is Jesus Christ. So in the midst of the lampstands, it is written there in, in, in Revelation chapter 1 verse 13, in the midst of the lampstands, it, which indicates the presence of God in the midst of the church. Okay, In the midst of the church, what is there? The presence of God is there. Because Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 says, for wherever two or three gather in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we are gathered in the presence of God and we have the presence of God in our midst. That's what we read in Matthew chapter 18 verse 20. And for wherever two or three gather in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Hallelujah. So in the middle of the lamb stands, there is one like a son of man. That is, Jesus Christ is always in the midst of the church and in the midst of the congregation. For example, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, okay, from Cedric, I think. Now, why is Jesus called the Son of Man and not Son of God? Okay, Jesus is called as both, as both. Son of God is there and Son of Man is there. Son of Man means when Jesus took the, or Jesus incarnated, or when Jesus took the flesh, just like a man, he is known as the Son of Man. Okay, that's the reason that he became a man. He was God and he became a man. And at the same time, the other other side, God is not, Jesus is known as the son of God. That means he is the son of God. Okay. At the same time, when he took the form of a man, he became the son of man. Okay. And the son of man was always standing and uh, walking among the churches. Okay. While Jesus was this, Jesus was on the earth, he was a son of man. He was a son of man. At the same time, he was the son of God. Okay, so he was doing everything as a son, as, as a man. He was doing everything as a man. So he was living among the people. He was living among the, I mean, believers. Okay, as a as a man. So that's the reason that it is written son of man. And in other verses, it is written son of God. Okay. Now in Old Testament, they had one lampstand and seven lamps. Okay, so connected to the lampstand, and it must be made out of the Poor, pure gold. Okay, it is in Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, verses 37 and 39. 37 and 39. Then you shall make its lambs seven in number, and they shall mount its lambs so as to shed light on the space in front of it. I shall be made from a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. Okay, so you can see one uh, uh, one uh, a picture about the lampstand, which is there. The lampstand, the picture is there. You can see in the slide, and that is the uh, lampstand which was used uh, uh, in uh, which is written about uh, in Exodus chapter twenty-five, verses 30, 37 and thirty-nine. So they were using. Uh, the, the, the Old Testament people were using this lampstand in their tabernacle. Okay, so that was the tabernacle. You know, uh, especially you look into that uh, uh, particular uh, picture um, that is made of pure gold. Okay, that lampstand is made of pure gold. And 
only one stand is there. Only one stand is there. You see that I mean, picture? Only one stand is there, but there are seven lamps. There are seven lamps. And all these seven lamps are connected to the single stand. All these seven lamps are connected to the single stand. That means today all the local churches all around the world must be connected to Christ always, then only it can spread the light into the world. That means Christ must be the center of the church. Christ must be the center of the church. Okay, so you can call maybe you can you can take it as a as a, I, as I told you, uh, the Old Testament is the uh, shadow and the New Testament is the reality. Okay, the reality is coming in the New Testament and the Old Testament is the shadow. So in the Old Testament, in, in, instead of the tabernacle, they were using a lampstand with the seven lights or seven lamps. Okay, there was only one stand and seven lights are there. Okay, so the same thing is happening, same, same vision. Here, Apostle John also is seeing that Jesus Christ is standing in the midst of the church. Jesus Christ is the center point of the church and all other churches or all other church members, all other local churches must be connected to Christ and Christ is the center. Okay, do not make any, any other people, any other person, any other, okay, let me tell you, any other object instead of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center point of the church and we must be connected always to the center point jesus christ as the lamb stand and then only you'll be able to spread the light to the world i mean that's the meaning of that and we will come to the third third vision that apostle john was having third one jesus clothed with a garment and a golden band at his chest Jesus clothed with a garment and a golden band at his chest. That is in chapter 1, verse 13. <laughs> chapter 1, verse 13. I'll read that verse. <clears throat> Chapter 1, 1 verse 13. And in the middle of the lamb stands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden band. Here, the third vision. The third vision is, Jesus is clothed with a garment and a golden band at his chest. That's in chapter 1 verse 13. Here Jesus is clothed with a garment down to the feet. It is written there. Okay. Jesus, the, uh, Jesus is clothed with a garment down to the feet. Down to the feet. Okay. And uh, um, uh, that garment, the speciality of the garment is, it is starting from above till the feet. Till the feet. In Malayalam it is written, uh, mele, I mean, uh, melengi. Okay. Uh, okay. No, no. Nilengi is right. Okay, in, in verse 13. Okay, Tirinja Paul, Nilengi Nilengi. It is Nilengi. Okay. So it was not an ordinary garment. Okay. So John was seeing Jesus Christ, I mean cloth with a garment, a special garment, which is which is down to the feet. Which is down to the feet. It's a it's a gown, just like a gown, down to the feet. Okay. So Nilengi. Uh, and it was not an ordinary garment but the garment of the kings and prophets and priests. Make sure that this was the garment of a king and the garment of a prophet and the garment of priest. That you can read from Judges chapter 8 verse 26. Judges chapter 8 verse 26. The weight of the gold uh, earring that he requested was uh, 1,700 shekels, it is 26, 826, yeah. Uh, besides the crescent ornaments and the, uh, then, and then, um, okay, so that, that verse is speaking about the king, okay, Kim, and king, 
must I mean wear these kinds of garment. That is what we understand. And again, First Samuel chapter twenty-eight, verse fourteen. First Samuel chapter twenty-eight, fourteen. Yeah. Fourteen, and he said to her, "What is his form?" And he said, "An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped with a robe." And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and did pray. So that means, you know, in again, Exodus chapter twenty-eight, verse four, also. So you can you can later read that verses, you know, uh, because uh, which speaks about the garment was used by by the prophets and the kings and the priests. Okay, so th that same garment here, Apostle John also is saying that Jesus Christ is clothed with a garment and a golden band at his chest. Okay, we'll go to that one, which indicates Jesus is the king of kings and Jesus is the chief prophet and Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the king of kings and Jesus is the prophet and Jesus is the high priest. That means the threefold office of Jesus. Threefold office of Jesus. So Jesus was used by Father God in different ways. So Jesus is a king and Jesus is a prophet and Jesus is a high priest. So these are the threefold office of Jesus that when we were studying uh, from book of Hebrews, we were, uh, we were just discussing about the Jesus, uh, the ministries, the ministry of Jesus, that means the priest, high priest and all those things. And, and uh, again, uh, there, is a, there is a golden band at his chest. That is in chapter one verse 13. And there is a golden band at his chest. Okay, it is there. It is there. I think in 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 the, the in okay the the next picture you will see that. So Jesus is the righteous judge. The meaning of the golden band, the meaning of the golden band at his chest, is Jesus is the righteous judge. Jesus is the righteous judge. That you will make it clear. Isaiah chapter eleven, verse. Three and five. Isaiah chapter eleven, verses three and five. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ear hear. And fifth verse also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness. The belt about his waist. Okay, so the golden band at his chest in the vision of Apostle John speaks about Jesus is the righteous judge. Jesus is the righteous judge. You now that's what Prophet Isaiah is saying that righteousness will be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Okay, so who is Jesus? Jesus is the Righteous judge. Jesus is the righteous judge. So, okay. Now, uh, we will go to the uh, next uh, uh, main heading. Uh, then we will stop there. Okay. The main heading is the, the, the sevenfold description of our Lord Jesus. The sevenfold description of our Lord Jesus. <laughs> 